Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sim City Preacher. Welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study. Yay for the Bible, for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Um, welcome if you're here for the first time. And I hope that uh, you enjoy the Bible study. I hope you really uh, have a, such a good time that you want to join us every Wednesday. Maybe you'll even want to join us on our Sunday program. The Sunday program starts at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time, and it's a uh, our, our church service. Um, okay, we're going to pick up with the Bible study. We're in Romans chapter uh, 13, verse 1 tonight. But before we get into it, let me ask uh, the, the saints here in the panel to uh, say hi to everybody. Uh, and maybe somebody doesn't know who you are, so just take one minute and introduce yourself. We'll start with Brother Michael. Hi, everybody. It's Michael Larray, Ultimate Mordecai here. I'm glad everybody showed up. You know me from my Ultimate Mordecai channel, and I preach the gospel of grace, and I try to preach it radically and offensively, because by grace, we have all been saved through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and it's by his blood that we are joined together as one spirit in the Lord, joined together as one, never, ever to be separated, never to be cast away, never to lose our salvation. We have it forever and ever. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. You offend everybody with not everybody, but you offend most people with that, that message about the cross. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Check this out. I'll show you guys real quick. This is from my friend, David. He sent me this shirt. If you can see it, can you read that? Yeah. That yeah, is did. awesome. Really? Yeah, David, David rules, is just... But Jesus sets us free. Yeah. David at Starfire, Alternity Brother in Christ sent this to me. So you see him sometimes in the chat room. I don't know if he's there tonight. He lives um, in the UK, I believe. So he's pretty uh, uh, different time zone than us. He yeah. sent me one. I get mine tomorrow. I saw. Oh him. yeah. I don't cool. know what mine says, but I, I'm waiting. Nice, nice. Uh, yep. Okay, I um, uh, I'm going to add that saying to the list of one-liners. I'm asking people to send in. Uh, really there you go. Religion sets the rules. Uh, Jesus sets us free. Sets free. So I'll have to remember write that down and add it to the list. Uh, while we're on the subject of shirts and stuff here, I have my shirt on here. Oh this wow! Tells you, this tells you. Oh, let me put the. Uh, this tells you who Jesus is on the front. Yeah. Wait, wait! I don't see. I don't see co-savior on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, Co-matrix or something? No, I forgot. And then this is on the back. Awesome. Amen. You know, that is it? awesome. Yeah, I've, I've always said that if we had to only you know, allow to use two words to somebody, pick two words you can tell them, nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't think of anything better than trust Jesus. Um, uh, okay, so now let's, uh, we have um, Michael introduce himself. Renee, while you're, you're already talking, so go ahead and tell uh, the people who you are if someone doesn't know you yet. Hi guys, this is Renee Roland, channel of the same name. I, like Michael, preach the true gospel. There's only one gospel, and it's the gospel of the grace of God. And it is offensive when properly preached. Uh, and if the message of the cross offends you, that there's nothing in you that makes you qualify for it, earn it, deserve it, or that, or that you can keep it by anything you do, uh, then you need to be saved. You need to believe the good news uh, because uh, most churches are compromising the gospel by making conditions of works, either getting, maintaining or proving your salvation. And uh, all of us here fight against that. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And uh, most people are offended by that. They don't like certain people being saved. They don't feel deserve it. But uh, like Michael, and I'm so proud of him for always, always radically preaching grace. Um, and uh, we're in good company here. We are, we are all slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil so good may come, whose damnation is just. Yeah, amen. Amen. Okay. And, and last, but certainly not least, is Brother Cripps. Well, <laughs> first of all, I just want to say this is this is pretty awesome because uh, three of maybe four or five 
people whose videos I listen to and I'm really edified by are all on the same uh, show right now. So uh, I'm I'm just really in a in a grateful place. I'm glad to be here with you guys and um, and to go over the word and stuff like that. It's just it's just absolutely awesome and it makes my week. It really does. So thanks guys for being here. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. We come on Sunday night at 9 p.m. And what we try to do is bring everyone to the table, regardless of beliefs, and actually sit down and, and try to have open conversations without hatred or bickering or uh, anger and frustration. We just try to be able to talk about things. And under that is the gospel of Christ uh, that, that we um, it's the cornerstone of everything. And we, we just try to get people to be willing to discuss it. And uh, we're pretty inclusive in that way. It's not, uh, it's not like some of these other uh, shows. There's lots of Bible study shows out there, as this one is, and I, I love doing that. Um, but uh, uh, True Story Live is telling the true story and, uh, and just, just trying to get to the bottom of things and have, um, have discussions. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm always glad to be a part of this broadcast and, uh, gosh, I, that's it. So thank, thank you for, uh, allowing me to be here again. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, there was a bit of a, a, a stir, uh, last couple of days, uh, because the Sunday broadcast, um, is not showing up as an, uh, one of my uploads. It is uploaded and. 500 people have watched it and people are in the chat room and they're in the making comments. So it's there. But for some reason, when you, if you click on videos on my channel, it's not showing up. It's because the, I, I interrupted the processing before it was done, I think. But um, what I did, though, is a blessing in disguise. It, it, I had to figure out a way of getting that video uh, visible for everybody. So I, I put it on my playlist, as, as always. I have a playlist called Church of the Eternally Secure. And that playlist contains all of the Wednesday and the Sunday programs and all the interviews. Uh, everything related to the Church of the Eternally Secure programs are on that playlist. <clears throat> and I arrange them in uh, order, chronological order. Uh, most recent will be first here. So, um, uh, and then I was able to move that playlist to the very top of my page. So the first playlist you'll see is the Church of the Eternally Secure uh, programs. So uh, I think that's going to be good because now the channel, the, the number one feature of the Sin City Preacher channel, there's are not all the videos and other playlists, but it's it's the church is the is the uh, the, uh, the first one listed. So I'm I'm happy that that came out of it. Um, all right, uh, let's get started with the study. Uh, if, by the way, uh, Romans chapter 13 uh, that means we've already studied 12 chapters, and we also spent a pretty good time introducing the whole book. So uh, if you are just joining us now for the first time on this study of Romans, uh, I hope at some point in time you'll go back and watch it all from the beginning. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll start off by, by reading here. Uh, uh, in the KJV uh, 13 verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Wow. Okay. I'm going to, I always like to start with Renee first, just because she's a, a lady saint. So oh. let's let her go first. Yeah. He's telling you if a person has been put in charge, I think this is specifically talking about in a position within the church. But also we see in other places, like in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about people in any position of power. They all need to be respected because God has allowed them there. It even talks about some of those people that are unjust, like a bad boss. He's there for a reason. And whatever you do, do it unto God. So if God has placed that person, uh, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. So what we're doing here is if a person is in a position, let's say a pastor or someone that is overseer of the flock, uh, the power is, is given him from God. And you don't do it because you like the pastor so much. It's because you're, everything you do, you do unto God. The powers that be are ordained of God. 
So if they're in a position, they've been put there by God and they, it needs to be honored and respected. Um, and that's all it's saying that, that whatever, when, when we honor a position, we, we know that God has allowed that person to be there. It is for his purposes. And we do uh, honor it as if we are honoring God, because we do honor God when, he, when we are, honor the higher powers. Okay. All right. Uh, Brother Michael? Yeah. So, you know me, I like to go into, um, into Greek, I like to kind of dissect this stuff down. Every person, that, that word person is suke. Or you might have heard it pronounced psyche in Greek, which is your soul, your mind realm. It doesn't say every spirit because our spirit is one with the Lord. There's no higher authority than having the spirit of the Lord in you, right? But it is our subjection in our soul, our mind realm. So when we're in subjection, the word for subjection is hupoteso. It means to actually to obey or submit to these powers, right? Obey or submit. Govern, governing is hooper echo. It means they are the ones that are above you, you know, not above your spirit. Nothing's higher than that because your spirit's one with the Lord. But they're in this, in this world. They're, they are above you and they surpass you. That's what that word means, that hooper echo. It actually comes from super echo. All <laughs> right. Like the word echo, if you can figure that one out. And then author authorities is exousia, which is governmental authority or power. So it's actually talking about literal government authorities, which is shocking because right now, I, I mean, here in San Diego, I hear nothing but people bashing on the president, talking bad all the time. And we should actually be praying for our superior authorities, not disrespecting them like that. You know, even if we don't like them, God put them in office for amen, a reason. Amen, amen. Amen. Sometimes they are put there because the nation deserves them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. God, God used who Cyprus. Cyprus wasn't even a, or Cyrus. I mean, Cyrus wasn't a believer, right? But God used him. God used Cyrus to do establish his will by the way. It says, and those which exist, they are established by God. They are established by God. Established is to so in Greek, T-U-S-S-O. It means that they are instituted. They are assigned and appointed by God. So I don't, I, you know what? No matter how I feel about any type of governmental authorities, you won't ever hear me bashing on them at all, right? Because God instituted them, whether we like it or not. All right. Thank you. Brother Cripps? Yeah. So the thing that helps me get through that, uh, Renee mentioned it, uh, you know, is working unto the Lord. It's in that same category because uh, it's hard to love some of the, the people in power. Um, Renee also mentioned having a bad boss. How many times have, have one of us had that, had a, had a boss that, uh, you know, we're subjective, uh, subjected to and we have to follow their rules and regulations and they get angry and upset with us. And how often do we have to deal with that? It's happened to me many times. There's always one person at work. It seems like there's always one person that's in a place of authority that um, it just seems to have it out for you. You know, I don't know. That's maybe it's just me. Um, but having the attitude of working as unto the Lord, that changed everything for me. When I, uh, when I started to integrate that into the way I feel about everything, and it ties into government officials. I mean, there, you could go on and on about Trump or on and on about Obama or whoever's president and say all these horrible things about them. Um, but there's several places in scripture where God brings this point uh, to our attention of, about him putting people in, in leadership. Um, what did, what did, uh, what did, um, Pilate say to Jesus, he said he, he couldn't believe he wasn't answering. He said, don't you know I have the power you know, to, to hand you over or not? And he says, any power you have comes to you from God. He just told him straight up, any power you have doesn't come for you from the Senate, doesn't come for you because you're elected. It comes to you because God allowed you to be in that place. Same with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he showed him, he put, made him a beast in the field for seven years to show him that the power he has comes from God. 
And it doesn't matter whether the person believes in him or not. The fact still remains that he put he puts people in places of power, whether they believe in God or not. And it, what? I was saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if we have the attitude, as Renee mentioned, of working unto God, and also that same attitude toward government officials and people in leadership over us, we're not worried about their attitudes. We're not worried about the way that they deal with things. We're understanding that everything we do, God sees. He He lifts us up. He admires he, he gives us good things because we're honoring him in doing that. And uh, it just really puts us in a better place. And the passage bears that out. It just, it, you know, I, I agree with what everyone else says. So thank you. All right. Um, this is the word of God. I believe it's true. I will abide by it. But there are some things in the Bible that I don't like. I'm sorry, Lord, I don't understand this. I just, I had this same problem for many years with the, the doctrine of eternal torment. It, I saw it, this is in the Bible. I believe the Bible, so I accept it. I taught it, I defended it, but I didn't like it. And eventually though, uh, with a lot more study, I, uh, I realized that I didn't understand it correctly, and the, the doctrine of eternal torment is a false doctrine, and I, I'm glad that I understand it correctly. Now, go to my playlist, What is the State of the Dead, and you'll get a more thorough explanation of, of the point I just made. But uh, this is a similar kind of thing. This, These verses here have always bothered me. I mean, I don't like our government right now. But I don't like it in the past. I don't like all the governments around the world. I don't like the leaders throughout all of history. It seems like almost all leaders throughout all of history all around the world have been bad for the most part. And and yet, I read this verse here, and I throw up my hands, and I say, Lord, maybe someday you'll explain why. Um, I try to balance it with the, the doctrine of free will. You know, God, God is sovereign, and, 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 but not though he's sovereign in the way that Calvinists say it. Calvinists say that it, uh, God is controlling every molecule that moves, every word that we speak, every thought we have, every action. God's controlling is like a puppet. We have no free will. Everything we do is God's directing and controlling it. And that's what I call hyper-sovereignty, taking the sovereignty of God too far. You cannot, and there's a lot of doctrines in the Bible that you have the correct position and then you have an extreme one way or the other. And it tends to be that, that way on almost everything. But it's true that God is sovereign, but the sovereignty of God is God made a sovereign decision to create humanity with free will no. and give up some sovereignty control so, so that we could have a free will because only with free will can there be an actual love relationship between man and God. We can't love God unless we have free will to, to do it. So uh, I believe that uh, in some ways God set things in motion and things play out. Like, for example, is everybody born with a birth defect? Did God create that person with a birth defect? I don't think God did. I think God created DNA and created uh, the system that we have and people procreate. I don't think God creates people today. You may be able to prove me wrong with scriptures, but I think the difference is that God created Adam and Eve, and then Adam and Eve have procreated, and all of humanity has procreated. But God, um, uh, I, I, there is some kind of a balance between how much God is involved in everything and how much freedom we also have. Um, but I, I absolutely reject that God controls everything like that because uh, that would make God evil because that means God is instigating and making us do all these evil things. So this verse, I, I don't like it, but I accept it. I just feel that I probably don't understand it. Okay, any more on that before we move on? I do, I do. Uh, when we get into, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to like spoil or alert, but when we get into the context of Romans 13, we're going to find out it's not like if, if, if they say, hey, go, go um, 
kill Christians. We're going to, you know, believers or quit reading your Bibles or anything like that. We're talking about they set up certain types of things. You know, you got speed limit laws. We're not just talking about president and the government. We're talking about, you know, you've got police officers and all that. And if you you drive 100 miles per hour and the speed limit says 65 and they got a red light on you saying pull over, you're going to pull over. Right. And, and you, we'll find out. We'll see. We'll see how it's it's not something super extreme in here. Right. Like, oh, the president just ordered behead your wife. <laughs> if you got a wife. Got, get... No, nothing like that. Right. Because God's our ultimate authority. We wouldn't want to do anything that is against what God's standard is. All right. Thanks. I wanted to read it in the Amplified also before we go on. In the Amplified uh, says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Uh, for there is no authority except from God that is granted by his permission and sanction. And those which exist have been put in place by God. All right. I'll go to the next verse unless any more needs to be said about that. Luke, yes. you have something on your lip. It's a, I don't know what, oh, it's a mustache. I'm sorry. Go ahead. God, <laughs> you didn't have God. that when I left. God made me a mustache. <laughs> I had my microphone off, Renee. We both said it's a mustache at the same time. <laughs> you see that? I grew about a couple of months ago. The chat room said, Luke, you should grow your beard back. You got a goatee. Full yeah, on. it looks yeah. good. You just grow your mustache and your beard back. And I always try to do whatever the congregation asks, if possible. <laughs> I, got, I first got permission from my wife. And mm -hmm. she said, yeah, I'll grow it back. So I did. <laughs> it looks good. All right. Thank you. You thought I would just didn't wash my face, huh? If that's the case, then I'm telling you, you should shave your head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to that. Was, we need a light moment after that anyway. Okay. Verse, uh, verse two in the KJV says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Let's go with uh, Brother Cripps first on this one. Yeah, so he, this is what I, again, this is what I love about Paul, how he gears things up. It seems like each chapter he, he starts making his points and then he explains it and puts a finer point on it. So um, the first verse is obviously he's stating the things about the powers being from God. And then uh, verse two, now here's, here's the consequences. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. So the first verse is saying that everyone in power uh, uh, is because God allowed that uh, to happen. Ordained, that's the words used here, ordained of God. And then in verse 2, now the consequences for the children of, that would disobey that, to resist the power, resist the ordinance of God. So he's, he's doubling down on that point and uh, trying to make sure that we understand. And I do agree with Michael, it's gonna make more sense as, as we get down a, a little bit and dive in. Um, but I understand that Brother Luke said he didn't like it. I, I don't like it either. And I didn't say that on my turn, but um, I mean, I could go story after story when I was a young, much younger man and um, I resisted a little bit. I resisted a little bit more than I do now. Uh, in fact, I, I wouldn't resist at all. I mean, be pulled over and I'm very respectful and, 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 you know, there's no issues there now. Um, but I learned pretty quickly that resistance is futile. I mean, it just is, um, w whether I realized it back then that it was uh, of God or not. And I, 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 uh, I did realize that, but I didn't put it in the same place, the same place of respect that I do now. Um, they literally beat it out of me, uh, <laughs> my, my will to resist was beat out of me. So um, uh, there's no point doing that anymore. Again, especially going back to the idea of if you're seeing it the way that Paul wants you to see it, then there should be joy in, in obeying the, the ordinances and things that are set in front of you because you're not obeying man, you're obeying God. So if you can keep it in that place, um, then that's, that's beneficial. All right, thank you. Uh, Brother Michael? Okay, so so yeah, um, this word like so. Therefore, whoever resists authority, resist is anti tasso. It means that you're setting yourself up against them, right? So this is a big deal. Like you know, some people actually do. They actually go and, and draw guns on the authorities, 
right? Police or whatever. They set themselves up completely against them. Resisting authority. But the one thing I was noticing is, you know, you have that word, um, you said damnation in King James. Mine says condemnation. It's not the same word as in Romans 8.1 for condemnation for those that are in Christ. But this isn't that you're setting up condemnation from God or damnation. This word for condemnation is... Um, Oh, where is it? I, I circled it, and now I can't find it. It's krima, krima, K-R-I-M-A. It means judgment or a lawsuit, right? So when you go against them, what can happen? You might have to go to court. They might find you guilty. They might throw you in jail, that kind of thing. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ, and that's a whole different meaning. It's a whole different meaning. But this is from the government authorities. You oppose them, then, then there's going to be consequences, right? And that's one of the consequences. Being in a lawsuit, getting judgment, jail, find whatever it is. Okay, good. I, I'd like to go next. Uh, I don't have much to say about this. I just, but I, I think it's interesting how you uh, zeroed in on that last word, uh, damnation. And as you said, in the KJV, it says that, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, of course, when we when we see the word damnation, we think of hell. And, uh, 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 and then you said that the, the your Bible it says, says condemnation. But let me read what the Amplified says. In this case, uh, it says, um, and those who have resisted it will bring judgment, that is civil penalty on themselves. That's, that, that goes along with what you said, Michael. It's like a lawsuit, a civil judgment against them. Yeah. So here I am, a KJV firstist. For 25 years, I was a KJV onlyist. Now I'm KJV first. Yeah. But this will give you an indication and a good reason why, hey, let's look at other translations. Let's consider Greek. Let's consider other translations. Maybe we can shed some more light on this uh, because uh, maybe some of the words you chose in the KJV are, are better expressed uh, different way. Uh, Renee? Yeah, this is a good example of a, a word being that could give the way wrong connotation in a whole area that's not even about that. It's also a good uh, place to show that you can be saved from many things. Uh, salvation is not always from hell or the second death or perishing. Uh, you can be saved from drowning. In this case, you'd be saved from consequences of rebelling against whatever authority is put in place. Uh, but like the law was made for the unrighteous, not the righteous. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't really add anything to it except uh, it, the authorities are there for a reason. They're put in place for order. They're put in place for the unrighteous that need to be told and have and have penalties for uh, breaking these things and not doing what's inherently right for people as a whole. Um, and that a, a saved person should just know inherently um, not, you don't even have to worry really, because if you're led by the spirit, you're, you wouldn't rebel uh, against any reasonable law that's in place. And I'm glad Michael brought up, you know, it's not saying, to break God's law in order to keep man's law, because we know in the last days that evil will be called good and good will be called evil and that there will be enforcements against our faith. So um, that's obviously not what it's talking about here. It is about the reasonable uh, authorities that are put in place to have civilization and order within communities and, and, and governments and, within a church and in the world in general. So, but damnation is a really strong word to use here. And I, I really reading that, I don't know why that word was chosen. Yeah, I, uh, we, we have a lot of people in our congregation uh, who are still uh, KJV only. And I don't object to someone being KJV only for themselves. I only object when they try to say KJ won't be only for you too. Don't you? You can't look at anything else. Then uh, we're free to look at all the translations and consider them all. And I find it to be helpful. And in this, I think, is a good illustration of uh, 
in this case, I think they're. they're Do you know, choice. Luke? There's some people that are so KJV only. You can show them from the Greek language, and they still come again. No, my KG. There's somebody that actually comes on my channel, blasts comments all the times, and then deletes his comments later after he blasts them. <laughs> and he's one of the KJV only. Doesn't care what Hebrew says. Doesn't care what Greek says. He only, only KJV because he thinks it's inspired. He thinks it's an infallible, inspired translation. But this word is not damnation. Just like KJV uses the word hell instead of the appropriate Hades, Gehenna, Lake of Fire. It takes it, Tartarus. It, instead of using the appropriate separate words, they have different meanings. Just says hell for everything. Kind of like when, when we, we with American language, Greek has a word love that has different meanings. But in English, we just use one word love, which means I love hamburgers. I love my wife. I love Jesus. All the same. Equal. But the Greek, they show you the different meanings of each word, what we call love. Same with hell. Same with damnation. It's not damnation. This word is krima. It's a judgment or a lawsuit. That's it. Okay. I just don't want to make sure everybody knows that you do love Jesus more than hamburgers. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let's go to verse 3 in the KJV. Um, it says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. I'm, I'm going to continue this. This is one thought, verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. All right, so Michael, it's your turn to go first. Verse three and four. Can you hear me? Did I unmute? Yes, I hear okay, you. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So these rulers, they're not a cause of fear for those that have good behavior. <laughs> I mean, that's... That's pretty simple, right? Like if you're driving down the street, for instance, in your car, are, are you afraid that a cop's going to be behind you? Not if you're doing what the speed limit says. Not if you're using your blinker and turning like you're supposed to. Not if you stop for pe uh, people that are crossing the road walking and all that. There's nothing to fear. Now, this is interesting because he says not for fear for good behavior, but for evil behavior. Now, behavior is ergon in Greek, E-R-G-O-N. It's your works or the things that you do. We're talking about the things that we do. Even us believers, even us believers, because if you go back to verse one, every person, every soul, every suke, right? Our spirit, your spirit is never a mess. Your spirit is always obedient to everything at all times. It's our soul, which is so attached to our flesh, right? And sometimes we might want to speed. Sometimes we might think that cop's a jerk or whatever. We might want to break the rules. So these guys, they keep your behavior in alignment, which is a good thing. We go back down to verse four. He says he's a, a minister of God, right? Because why is that? Because God said, even if he's an atheist, he's still a minister of God without even knowing it because God set this person in authority or these men in authority, women in authority, and yours says the revenger. Mine says an avenger. I like avenger better because it's more common today. You know, you got the avenger movie. And um, this word for avenger or revenger is ekdikos. Ekdikos. It's one who carries out justice. That's it. They carry out justice and they bring wrath. Wrath is orge, O-R-G-E, which is punishment. For those that practice evil and practice is prasso. It's the habitually doing over and over and over bad stuff. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, uh, Renee, verse three and four. Yeah, I'm coming. I had my thing stuck again. Hold on. <clears throat> I'm pulling it up. Uh, again, you don't have anything to fear because the laws aren't made for the righteous. I mean, they're made for the unrighteous. They're to keep people that don't have 
the innate desire to do what is right and best for others, right? It's to punish the unrighteous, to keep them in line. It's not made for the righteous. For rulers are not a terror to good works. As he said, if you're doing what's inherently right, you don't want to cause anyone's death in a car accident. You're not going to speed past a school bus that stopped letting children off because you care about the children's safety. Uh, so they're, they're not a terror to good works, but to evil. So it's people that have authority to keep the laws and enforce those laws. Like it says, he that beareth the sword, uh, he, he doesn't bear the sword in vain. He is to use the sword against those that would break the laws that would harm others. Or you, you see what I'm saying? And it says, but then we'll, Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So the same people uh, that punish the wicked will praise what's right. For he that's the minister of God to thee, for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. So he is the power to justly punish whatever rule you have broken for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So God has uh, made that position to keep order and to punish uh, uh, breakers of laws. But if you do what's inherently right anyway and abide by them, you don't have anything to fear is, is all he's saying. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, the, you know, you if you've heard my... Uh, interview with my testimony where I talked about my life you know I kind of shared it all with you I, I have a, a very sordid past in a lot of ways uh, I've been on both sides of the law as far as a lawbreaker and then trying to be a good citizen and uh, I've got a number of friends that are either in prison now or they're they're dead and I would be there with them if I if I had got caught like they did and so uh, but what I have learned is that there were times where I've had encounters with authorities and it went very well for me be, be, because of the way that I was respecting them. And, and I was following. Follow. Well, one time I got, uh, I don't mean to repeat that story here, but it's just fortunate they didn't look in my trunk <laughs> that day or you would never have met me. Uh, but uh, um I, I'm just trying to say, I do think that this is a very good, not only point, but a, a, a lesson for us to learn and follow in life. And that is, if we're doing the right thing, now this is not always true, because I know that there are, particularly in America, there still is some discrimination against some minority groups. And, and sometimes I don't think police treat them the same that they, they treat the rest of us. But, but I would say that for the most part, if we are not a lawbreaker and we we have, we have nothing to fear, we just will be respectful to them and it'll all work out well for us. They are here to protect and serve. But on the other hand, we know that there's corruption in every in every part of life, uh, including the authorities. Um, okay, uh, let me, Brother Cripps. Yeah, so does everyone remember the wild, wild west? Everybody remember that? So all I want to point out is these things are a blessing from God, these things that are in place. And if you're sitting in the backseat of a police car, you wouldn't see it that way. But when the police are rescuing you, rescue, rescuing you from uh, trouble or from evil, then you're, they're your favorite people. Um, back when we moved out west as a country, when it was just pretty much the East Coast and we started to expand west, there was a period of time I mean, this is historical. I mean, you can, anybody can look this information up, but there was a period of time where people lived far away from law. And we got a good idea of what happens when there's no law, there's no authority. I mean, there weren't even states. They didn't start out as states. They were territories and the territories became states and they brought government in as things built up. And then, then law was restored. And this is, this is the way that we are. Um, you see a lot of times when there's a riot, when the power goes out. Uh, and this happens today. 
power goes out, what do people do? They break the law, they loot, they break into stores and steal everything they can. Um, and it's pretty widespread. People that wouldn't normally steal or break into a store if the power goes out and the law is not around, they will do that because our hearts are evil. We're born into a sinful world without Christ. It is in our nature to do things like that. But for those of us, as, as Renee pointed out, it's not for the righteous. It's a protection for the righteous. It really is. Without these these the law in place, without police being around, and yes, do they abuse their power oftentimes? Absolutely they do. Overall, though, the, these things are in place to protect us from those that would do evil continually. And we know, uh, prophetically speaking, it's still going to get worse and worse. As someone mentioned, uh, bad becomes good and good becomes bad, and that's already happening. I mean, we're already seeing that um, slide in that general direction. Um, so I'm just, you know, the older I get, the more thankful I am for that. And then uh, verse four is just making the same point again, that these, these things are ministers uh, from God to thee. That's the point I'm making to thee. That's us. Everyone's uh, thee is us for good. It's a protection from God. Thank you, brother. I, I'm, I'd like to us to take a minute and respond to uh, Daniel's uh, thoughts in the chat room here. Uh, he, he wrote, "Why protest? So then, why protest abortion if it's ordained uh, from the powers that be?" Uh, I'm lost here. Um, I will say that um, there has to be a like uh, the point I made much earlier is that there is a, a a correct viewpoint, and then there you can take that viewpoint to an extreme this way or an extreme that way, and uh, we. It is true that we should respect the authorities. They are ordained by God. Uh, and uh, probably if we do respect them, we're not going to be in any trouble because we're not lawbreakers. We have nothing to fear. That's all true. That's what the scripture says. And yet there are times where we have to stand up to the law, the authorities, even though they're in place because they're it's ordained by God. That's what the scripture says. Uh, example, Daniel defied the order and prayed. Um, and and um, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did the same thing. They defied the orders of the authorities. Even Peter and the, 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 the apostles at the beginning of the church, they were ordered to stop their preaching and they, they, did, they defied the authorities. Um, Brother Luke, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I want to add when you're done. I'm sorry, I thought you were done. Yeah. And so there are, there are things that, uh, that uh, there, there are principles that, that actually will supersede this sometimes. And uh, there is a time to stand up against authority if it's evil. Um, uh, all, all right. So go ahead, Renee. Yeah, I was just going to say just because a government says something is lawful doesn't mean you do it. Uh, what this is talking about are ordinances and laws of the land that protect people and protect uh, society as a whole. And that's what he's talking about in general. But you'll see in scripture that God's laws, if they are in opposition to man's laws, must always first be obeyed. That's that's common sense. Just because, you know, uh, uh, the, the law says you can kill your unborn child. Does that mean you should? Of course not. But that this isn't, this is talking about general, I mean, because you can open up a whole can of worms here. Well, what if it tells me, like Michael said, to behead my wife? Okay, well, th it's just getting silly. Because this, this, this verse here is just talking about the, you know, uh, the standards uh, of government that are to keep things in order. And that if you do well and, and you're doing what God wants you to do, you shouldn't have to worry about, uh, these people in authority because they're only there to punish the evil, you know, uh, that is done in society against other members of society. So um, I, I agree with Luke and everyone here just because a government says it's lawful to do something. If God's law says don't do it, I mean, we, we just use common sense here. 
this, but this particular section of scripture is not even discussing that, you know, I just didn't want to get off on a tangent on, you know, the what ifs. Okay. Um, uh, any more before we go to verse uh, five? I'll just say something because he, the, the guy that was a Daniel, he, um, he, he was saying, you know, what about people that want to protest? I mean, protest is, is it, I've never been a part of a protest. I'm not really into that, but if you do protest, I mean, the people have a right to have a voice. It doesn't mean you're opposing authority, but if you, you know, abortion, you know, uh, we might consider like a moral issue. You know, if you don't like the law that, that they say it's okay. I mean, like Renee was saying, it doesn't mean that if the law says it's okay, that you'll go get an abortion. If you're not for abortion, then don't do it. Right. It's not saying you have to. Is saying that you know people are allowed to if you're against that people are allowed to that's just something that where you're trying to give a voice and it's lawful to protest by the way protests aren't against the law as far as i know not here in america anyway okay all right verse five in the kjv says wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience sake I'll do everybody a favor and read verse 5 in the Amplified now, too. We'll start with Brother uh, Cripps on this one here. Uh, brother, Verse 5 in the Amplified says, um, Therefore, one must be subject to civil authorities, not only to escape the punishment that comes with wrongdoing, but also as a matter of principle, that is, knowing what is right before God. Brother Cripps? Yeah, there's not a whole lot to add to that. I, uh, but I, I agree with that. It's like you know we're taught when we're children, and I think sometimes we obey to avoid consequences rather than uh, <laughs> because we want to not uh, steal cookies from the cookie jar without permission. Um, we do it because the consequences are set in place, and the law works the same way. These laws are are put in place, um, and a lot of them are to. Uh, literally keep people from doing it because they see the consequences that people face still doesn't always stop people but that's what it is but as believers we have a different attitude we want to do things in obedience to god because of everything he's done to us that and that's the uh the conscience uh part um and you just sleep better i mean i i uh, i like the brother luke said he's been on both sides of the law he's been been a law breaker and a law abider and uh, I have two in some ways, uh, nothing crazy, but uh, certainly I feel better when I drive the speed limit. Then I'm not worried about being pulled over. Every time you go 10, 20 miles above the speed limit, what are you doing? You're craning your neck around looking for that cop sitting behind a, a sign or a big rock or a tree somewhere. Um, if you're obeying the law, you don't have to worry about that. Your conscience is clear. And it's it's better for you. Your general attitude is better for you. It's it's pretty simple, but that's that's uh, that's where I'm going with it. All right, um, brother Michael. Okay, so let's let's get into um, where it says for conscience' sake. You know, you you're not you're not obeying because you're afraid of wrath. Basically, not because like, I, I'm not going to murder somebody because I'm afraid if I do, I'm going to go to prison or get the electric chair. This, for conscience sake, is the Greek word sune idesis. It means having a moral sense, a moral sense, right? Oh, I'm going to murder that guy because I love that person. Not because I have to love them, but God put his love for them in me, right? It's also, if you take it to another, another direction, the, the law here in San Diego, on the, we have freeways. It says you can go 55. But let's say... There's tons of traffic. It's raining outside. Now you might want to, for your conscience sake, or sune idesis, for a moral sense, say, hey, it wouldn't be good to drive 65, even though the law says I can. But right now, it's not safe conditions. So I think I'm going to slow it down quite a bit so I don't hurt myself or hurt other people. All right. All right, Renee. Yeah, it, it's saying uh, don't obey just because you don't want the consequences of it, but do it because you know your side of the street is clean. You know, you know that you're doing what God would want you to do, not just uh, 
to avoid the ticket or going to jail, like he said, or whatever. Do it for conscience sake. Before uh, I was a Christian, um, I read a lot of uh, motivational self-improvement books. And uh, I also collected a lot of um, like proverb types of sayings, words of wisdom. And uh, uh, one of them comes to mind now. It says, uh, um, doing the right thing is its own reward. That's it, that it, the reward is just doing the right thing. You don't, there's nothing else that it is, uh, is needed or, or, or other motivation of just knowing that I'm doing the right thing and the satisfaction you have knowing that you're doing the right thing is, is should be reward enough rather than uh, fear of getting in trouble or the desire for some kind of profit. Yeah, M Michael. I'm good. I, didn't, I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to say, Brother Luke, you should bring that back. Bring that attitude back because it certainly has disappeared. When I was a kid, you used to hear people, remember back when, you can remember this, Brother Luke, remember back when a handshake was your word? You shook someone's hand and, and they just took it for granted that that was going to, that, that you were going to fall through with that. You'd be laughed at if you did that now, if you didn't uh, insist on uh, signing a contract or anything. Because the general attitude of people was what Brother Luke just said, which is that doing good is good for the sake of doing good. That's it. That's the, that, that's the way your atti attitude should be. Um, and we've gotten far away from that. It's, it, in my opinion, it's gotten worse and worse. I'm not, I'm not even that old yet, but I'm sure as I get older, I mean, it's, it, I'm going to look at everything in that same way. It's like it's gotten so far away from my grandfather's generation, when your word was your bond, you shook someone's hand and that was the contract. You didn't have to do all this other stuff because people kept the word because it was, it, it was general. It was generally uh, respectful to do good for good sake. That's it. All right. Uh, verse six in the KJV says, for this cause pay ye tribute also for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Uh, okay, Brother Michael? Basically, it says that's why you, you pay taxes. That's what tribute is. It's taxes. That's what our tax money goes for, to pay for them to be, um, to, uh, to pay for these authorities. Um, okay, Renee? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, Jesus said, render under Caesar's what's Caesar's. Daniel was asking, you know, our constitution says you don't pay income tax. Well, now our government does say you have to pay it. So rather than, they're never going to go back on it. Okay. They make too much money on it. They will never go back and say, you don't have to pay money on your income. So right now the law is you have to pay it. It would, it'll take lifetimes to get that reversed. And I don't think it'll ever happen. So the best thing to do right now is just be obedient, pay what the government asked, give to Caesar what Caesar's, and then God will bless you for, for being uh, non-rebellious to it. Uh, I understand that that was not the original context of taxing, but that is where we are right now, and that is where the law stands. And if you don't pay it, you will go to jail. So I would say just pay it, and God will bless you. Don't don't worry about what the government's taking. God God's going to take care of you on that one. All right. Uh, I'm going to say something. I'd like to get uh, Brother Michael's uh, thoughts on this. I imagine you you've, uh, have an opinion. But obviously, we, we do need uh, some kind of a taxation so that uh, everybody can share the, the cost of funding certain things that are needed for a society. Uh, but when we look at Israel, uh, um, particularly um, like Israel under the system of uh, the really the the high priest and then the priest system and the, the Levite tribe uh, they didn't get an inheritance of land the way that um, the, the other 11 brothers did uh, they so they were expected to be supported by the, the by the the whole and, and that's the system of tithing 
to me, I've always considered tithing to be a uh, basically a tax uh, that people pay to support the the government because it was a theocracy. A theocracy is a government based on God uh, being the, the leading you. And uh, so Israel was a theocracy and the government was uh, really the, the priest's system and they didn't have any other jobs and they didn't have any other wealth. They were relying on the rest of the people to pay this tithe to them to support this uh, priest system. Uh, so in that way, we're, what, everything that we're doing today and other countries do when they have a system of taxation to support these things, that's what tithing was, I think. Uh, Michael? That's interesting, yeah. Um, I, I could see that for back then. And, um, and, and today, you know, we give our, our taxes to our governments. You know, I, and I'm one that I believe that um, where we are spiritually now, we, instead of tithing, I believe we do gifts and offerings, not because we have to, but because we want to. There's, a, there's, um, there's something, though, that, that the government demands, even if you're negligent, like Renee was saying, you get in trouble if you don't pay taxes. I'll give you an illustration. Back in, um, in 2004, I got, I, well, in 2003, I got identity thefted and it was a huge, huge mess. And I just got done going through divorce. You know, I left the Jehovah's Witnesses religion, went through a divorce. It was a nightmare, you know, a lot of money. Then in 2003, I get identity thefted and I'm like, okay, so all this stuff that happened and I was being stupid and foolish with my money too. Right. I was doing a lot of stupid stuff. So I, um, I had to declare bankruptcy. So I sold my business and I, um, I, I didn't work. I, I lived off my business, the money I made for about a year and a half, almost two years, you know, and I was super depressed. I couldn't get out of my house. Nothing it was back then. Well, anyway, I thought, well, since I didn't work, in 2004 like half of 2004 half of 2005 that i didn't need to um i didn't need to uh claim my taxes you know file a tax form you know you have to file every every year and turn them in by april i didn't do that it, i was negligent do you know <laughs> in 2014 it came back to bite me hardcore the irs they, what they call it, they, um, oh, when they empty your bank account, there's a term for it. They uh, levied, they levied my bank account. I had no idea. Everything I had in there was suddenly 0, 0.00 balance. And then as these things, you know, automatic payments like insurance and all this stuff is going through my bank, it's bouncing. So now I'm having all these bounce fees. And what's going on? Well, so I go to the bank and they tell me, well, the IRS levied your account and you have to get in touch with them. So I got in touch with the IRS and they said, well, you owe us taxes. You know, we sent you a letter in 2011 saying that you owed us for 2004 and five. I said, but, but I had an attorney. I, he sent you guys a letter and explained everything. They said, well, we needed that explanation from you because just because you are naive and negligent doesn't mean that you still don't file your taxes. So so they took about $5,000, around $5,000. That's what I had in the bank back then. I, um, so they, they had me write them letters. I talked to the IRS. They were super nice, by the way, super nice people, very friendly to me. I liked talking to them. And then um, I explained everything. And so they, told, they sent me a letter saying, okay, you'll get some money back. And I'm not joking you. Do you know they did send me a check back? Guess how much I got back? Because they have, they have – I can't believe you said that. 23 cents. They gave me a 23 cent check. Point, point two three wow. cents. It was almost like a whoosh, slap in the face because all the fines that they charge me and, and, and being late and all that. And I'm like, oh, it's like giving a waitress you don't like her, so you give her a penny <laughs> to insult her. <laughs> yeah, that's what they did to me. And that was totally negligent. But you know what? I still, I should have known the laws of the land, right? I didn't think it was fair, but I still had to do it. And there was nothing I could do about it. As far as tithing goes, I don't want to go too long and take up all of our time, but um, it's in the book of Hebrews. This is why I, you know, when people say, well, Melchizedek, we're under the Melchizedek priesthood and we should still tithe because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. It says in the book of Hebrews 
that the Levites, the Levitical priests, they tithed. They didn't actually pay tithe, but they tithed because they were in the loins of Abraham. And because they were in the loins of Abraham when Abraham tithed in Melchizedek, it's credited to the Levitical priests. Now, you and I, we are king priests as well, right? In Christ, right? So you and I, because we're in the loins of Christ, who's in the loins of Abraham, we're in the loins of Abraham as well, because he's the father of believing, right? He believed, we believe. So because Abraham tithed, I believe that's part of the new covenant. While we don't have to, it's considered as if we already tithe, just like it's considered like, like we obeyed all the laws and commandments. We take all our thoughts captive to not our obedience, but to his obedience. So that's why I don't think we have to tithe in this new covenant, but I do believe in gifts and offerings. I think if the Holy Spirit motivates you to, to, to help somebody out or whatever way, so your, your brothers, your sisters, even the strangers that you don't even know, so that they don't have to go in need. I think it's an awesome thing. I have a lot of people that give gifts to me, and I'm super thankful for it. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, uh, Mr. Rich Bob in the chat room says, well, Michael, my brother literally told me this doctrine earlier today. Yeah. Wow. Which, which doctrine? Uh, the, the doctrine, I think he's talking about the doctrine that you, or the idea that you said that uh, we paid our tithes because we follow all the, all the, we're credited with following all the laws. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, any more on this from uh, Brother Cripps or Sister Renee before we, we move on? I don't have anything to add that uh, everyone else has already already dealt with it on this one. All right. Then, Brother Cripps, maybe you can go first on this on this next verse here. In the KJV, it's uh, uh, verse 7 says, Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Crips? Yeah, it's just saying, uh, uh, it's just saying, Pay everything to everyone that, that you should pay it to. I mean, and, and that's that's easy to, you know, you, you pay your electric bill because you want the power to be turned on. Pay that. You know, you pay your taxes, and, and we've already covered that, why we pay taxes. Um, uh, yeah, there's just whatever whatever things that are required for you to pay. And the, the last one, honor to whom honor, um, you know, we're supposed to honor the people in authority. Um, even if we, it, it's not dependent on whether we like them or not. And so he's just making this point here, just, you know, pay, pay the things you need to pay to the people in the places that are requiring that, uh, to, to be done. I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's not real complicated. Yeah. yeah, it is simple. And it does get back to brother Michael's point about the trouble and the, the stress and worry. I, I've been in the same kind of a position with IRS, so. Um, many, many years ago, I, I, I had uh, my f problems with them and it caused great stress. I mean, it seems like they have rights, unless you get the very best tax attorney. I eventually he did actually do that and it really solved my problems of getting the right tax attorney. But um, uh, they, many people feel absolute terror when they owe the IRS money and, and they're not, not able to pay it. And uh, uh, it's a very fearful thing. So the best thing you can do is stay on top of that and do what you're supposed to do and be, uh, um, what is it, um, diligent when it comes to those things. And you don't want to get into that kind of a trouble because it'll really, people have killed themselves. A lot of people committed suicide because the stress of the IRS coming after them has been so great. Uh, Sister Renee? Yeah, I'm pulling the verse up here. Uh, are we going to, well, uh, it's kind of hard for me to answer without going to the other verse. Can I just wait till we get to them? Because then I, I won't mess up that. Yeah, yeah, I'll read it now and then you can go in there. It says, it says, uh, it says um, pay to all what is due. Tax to whom tax is due, customs to whom customs, respect to whom respect, honor to whom honor, owe nothing to anyone except to love and seek the best for one another. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading this in the Amplified. So, um, for yeah. anyone who unselfishly loves his neighbor has fulfilled the essence of the law relating yeah. to one's fellow man. Yeah, so I won't really be going too far ahead if I mention this. The whole thing is when Jesus was explaining laws, most of men's laws are based upon God's laws. Uh, most of the things you'll see in our government are based upon the commandments of God, the foundational truths of what is considered uh, right, honoring God and honoring others, that everything is sacred. Your relationship with God is sacred. Your relationship with others is sacred. Your relationship with your husband and wife is sacred. Their relationship with their husband and wife is sacred. Their property is sacred. Your property is sacred. Uh, it's all sacred. So, you fulfill the law with love. That's bottom line. Because if you love someone, you won't try to take their husband or wife. When you love someone, you won't steal their property. Uh, when you love so when you love God, you won't desire what someone else has. You'll be grateful to God for what he's given you. So uh, fulfilling man's laws is the same as fulfilling God's laws because they're all based on loving your neighbor as yourself. So that's the whole of the law, whether it's God's or man's, uh, in a general sense. Yeah. And didn't, didn't, John, didn't John write love is all there is love is all there is. And it covers a multitude that, of sins. That's a different John though. <laughs> John <Lennon. laughs> okay. Love is all you need. I think is what you're thinking of. No, love is all there is too. Yeah. Oh, what, what, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I don't know. Well, but maybe I'm saying it wrong, but the, uh, yeah. Uh, Sometimes a person says something profound and they get credit for this profound idea. And of course, it's a, it's a principle in the Bible. Uh, all right. Well, let me uh, read a little further and then get uh, Brother Cripps, you seem ready to go. Okay. Oh, oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he hath loved another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Brother Cripps? Wow. Well, Jason, that song is the same song. You're right. It's the same exact song. <laughs> That's okay. No, no problem. It's the same one. I just wanted to confirm it for you. Yep, yep. Oh, great. Um, the, the beauty of this whole thing is Paul's backing up what Jesus said. Jesus is the one that said that, uh, uh, you know, he asked what, what the uh, greatest commandment is. And, you know, he's saying to love God with everything and love your neighbors yourself. On this, all, all the uh, wraps up all the law and the prophet or ties in all the law and the prophets. So Paul's making the same point. He goes to the trouble to naming some of the, the Ten Commandments and saying, all of these are tied up and they're fulfilled. If you do this, the love part, I mean, you fulfilled the law. So he's, he's doubling down on what Jesus said and, and, and making a finer point on it uh, here. Um, and, and the idea of loving, uh, loving thy neighbor as thyself. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, and, and this would be a good, good way to point it out to, to those people that, uh, when they're going against others for, yeah, have you done this? And, or, you know, are you obeying the law? This is the law here. It's all wrapped up right here. Uh, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. This is what he's stating right here. Um, so okay. Jesus said it and Paul backed him up. Brother Cripps, I'm, I only interrupt you because it's getting close to time for uh, Brother Michael to leave us. It's 7.43, so you said you had to leave at 7.45. Yeah, I have two minutes. I have an appointment at 8, so if I leave my home yeah. in two minutes, I can make it. Yeah. All right, so give us your thoughts uh, on that, but it seems to me, I, Michael, I'll pose it to you in a question. It seems to me Paul is kind of plagiarizing Jesus here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I know in the last chapter, a lot of the same things I said, hey, it sounds a lot like what Jesus said. So Paul is really teaching us things that Jesus said. How did Paul learn that, do you think? Yeah, through the Holy Spirit and through also what other people said to him. And he knew the law more than anybody as well. The cool thing about what Jesus said is, you know, love. But then under grace, we can't love 
until we know that he first loved us. The only way that we can give love to others is if we first have it in us, because you cannot give what you do not have. The law demands love to be withdrawn from you. Grace supplies you with the love. It imparts the love into you. So it's supernaturally done already. The fulfillment of the law, this word fulfilled isn't the same thing that Jesus, when he yelled, finished on the cross or fulfilled, he said, klino in Greek. But in Hebrew, he said, Kula, this fulfilled in, in, in that he's talking about the fulfillment of the law is pleroo. It make, means to make full or complete. We are showing what is, what is already done. It's already done. So when we are fulfilling by law, law, it's not that we're already filling up that something that Jesus fulfilled already. We are just taking what he already put in, into us and showing the completeness of it. Do you understand? It's already in us, deposited. Now we are withdrawing what he put into us. Amen. Amen. And now I got to go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, gotta brother. Go. All right. Go, go take a bit, care of your business. And All right. uh, thanks, for, thanks for being with us tonight. Look forward to next time. Thank Great you, to you guys. You, Thank you. I love you all in the chat room as well. And I, I'm glad to be part of this. And um, we'll see you all soon. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. God bless you. Bye bye. All right. Uh, okay. Um, let me read further now. Um, uh, oh, Renee, did you talk about that uh, that portion of scripture yet? Through verse uh, nine, through verse ten. No, verse no, nine. I mean, I basically said all I'm going to say is that the fulfilling of the law is love. So. Okay, so let me read verse 10 then and get your thoughts on that. Uh, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Yeah, it, it's what uh, I was saying earlier. If, uh, the law is basically saying everything is sacred. And everything that's yours is sacred. Everything that's theirs is sacred. And <clears throat> so when uh, you love someone, you don't take their husband. When you love someone, you don't steal their things. When you uh, love someone, you're not upset when good things happen to them or rejoicing when bad things uh, happen to them. Uh, so love really does fulfill the law. And if we came from that angle, just in a general sense of having the love of Christ in us, we, we wouldn't see so many of these legalists running around counting the dead letter because it would naturally just come out. It wouldn't occur to them to do these things or to think you're getting away with some license to sin. Because what you're saying is it gives me, I, I want a license to not love like Christ loved me and nobody wants that license and that's why those forgiven much love much because they've received the love and the grace and so now because they've been given it they can give it but when you don't have it you can't give it and that's when the dead letter comes in and so the fulfilling of the law which basically is love I think that that's a, a great way this verse puts it amen yeah um, what is it? The um, is it First Corinthians seven, or is it thirteen? That's the love chapter that talks about how faith, hope, and, and love, but love um, is uh, most important. Is that chapter seven or thirteen? But uh, these things abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Yeah, it's it's called the love chapter. The whole chapter. Yeah, I'm not sure, but that's a great one, Luke. Yeah. Uh, and but but Jesus, you know, he said, I'll sum up all the law, condense it all down. Just do this one thing and, and you'll be doing well, because if you're really expressing love to someone, you're not going to be stealing from them and uh, committing adultery against them or, or lying to them. If you if you really that love is is acted out towards someone. Um, all right, let's go to verse uh, number 11 in the KJV, Brother Cripps. And that, knowing the time, that now it is a high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Wow. 
Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. So if he's saying that back then, how much truer is it now? Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. And I believe he's talking about Christ's return, the end of all things, uh, the way that it is now, and the renewing of, uh, of his kingdom. I believe that's what's referring to. Maybe Renee can fill that in when, um, when it's her turn. Uh, but the, the part about awake out of sleep, I mean, that's huge. And there's so many different ways that uh, you can apply that to different things. Um, for me, it just it just means I to keep my mind focused on uh, on heavenly things and godly things and seeking His righteousness. Uh, to me, that's being awake and and putting Christ in the center of all things and keeping my eyes on Him. Um, that way, I'm never going to be taken by surprise. A believer is not going to be taken by surprise at His return. They're not going to be surprised in death because they're they're in right standing with God because they're trusting in Christ for all things. Um, so they're awake to uh, the idea of uh, it being Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added. Um, yeah, that's all. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Renee, verse 11, I'm anxious to get to verse 12, but go ahead. Tell us about verse 11. This is one of those verses, brother Luke, they like to twist to prop up their false doctrine that, yeah, I know you've heard people say this, nobody's saved yet. As if you got to persevere to the end, the Calvinist, you know, you got to persevere to the end because he who endures the end will be saved and, you know, all that stuff. And see, salvation's closer, so we don't have it yet. But they're forgetting we were saved already from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin, and we will be saved from the presence of sin. And Jason is absolutely right that our salvation is nearer, meaning the salvation of our bodies. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. And he's absolutely right in saying that the salvation of the fullness of our salvation will be complete because Jesus's coming is nearer now than when we believed. And so uh, th th he's absolutely right in the context of that. So I, I'm i glad we addressed this one. As you, what do you call me? The untwisted sister. I hate when they, they take these verses and twist them up to prop up that nobody's saved yet. So nobody can be at peace yet. Everybody's got to be wondering. No, John said he tells us these things so that we may know that we have eternal life because we have believed on the name of Jesus. So this, uh, and I like how he explained being awake, being aware that Christ's return is soon. Be aware of the signs. Be aware of where we are in the world uh, to know that we will see him soon. We're going to see our Savior face to face, and we will answer for every idle word spoken, you know, and how we treat others. It talks about that, you know, when we judge without mercy, we'll be judged without mercy. That's not for eternity. That's temporally, experientially here. But um, I like how he put that. I mean, I could, certainly can't put that uh, any better about being awake. But the salvation being nearer than when we first believed, he's absolutely right. It's about uh, uh, the fullness of our salvation, uh, Christ's return, and our uh, glorified state. Amen. Amen. You know, I live in, in Las Vegas. And we're not too far away from Utah. Every summer in Utah, in Cedar City at the university there, they have a, a Shakespeare festival. For the whole summer, they have some great theaters there and great actors, and they do Shakespeare and other plays. We like to go there every summer for a couple of days and take in some of the plays. And though Shakespeare is hard to understand, he kind of, you listen to it, and after a half hour, an hour, it starts understanding it. But before that, it almost sounds foreign to me. Um, but the, uh, the Shakespeare and the KJV is a Shakespearean type style of writing that is really beautiful and poetic. And there's a lot of reasons that I'm a KJV firstist. Uh, one is that the KJV has a lot of verses that the um, so-called modern translations either have omitted 
or they, they put a footnote saying it's they challenge whether it was in the original. Uh, and some of these verses are extremely important verses too. So I want the KJV because it has all the verses. Uh, but also the KJV sometimes, I, I've admitted this often, sometimes the language confounds me. I've had to go a couple of times to the Amplified to, to read it, to, to, get, to get a little clarification. And I'm I'm pretty educated. I'm pretty good with the English language, but um, it's not my native way of speaking this King James English. Uh, but there are verses in the KJV that when you put it into another translation, it just loses all its beauty. And the, to me, one of the most beautiful verses is this one I'm going to read now. Uh, the night is far spent; the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Uh, Yay! Uh, it is just so beautiful. I mean, there's a, there's many verses I could single out as saying this is the, the way it's written. The language is so beautiful. And in this case, it's very clear. It's not confusing me in any way. But uh, uh, Brother Cripps, you probably want to talk about verse 12. Oh, I, it's beautiful. I love the way it ends. And let us put on the armor of light. I mentioned recently when when people are cast out into utter darkness, it's because they they are not, they don't have the proper clothes on. They they're not they're not clothed with with Christ's righteousness. That that's why they're cast out. I mean, that, that they didn't believe in Him. They didn't accept the the correct clothing. And in this way, Paul's talking about the armor of light. What is the armor of light? Uh, I believe it's referring to the righteousness of Christ. It's it, it's not some arbitrary thing that we pick up and we we. It's not made by our own hands. It's given to us by by God. It is the clothing. It is the armor of light. Who is the light? Who is the way, the truth, and the light? It is, of course, Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. So the armor of light is that protective clothing. It also, it also, it it it, it works as uh, a wedding uh, outfit as well. It's the same thing that we walk into the wedding with uh, when we're accepted, because it, it's uh, we're clothed in His righteousness. Because our, um, I heard Renee say this on one of the um, one of the uh, shows that she did today. You know, it's our righteousness is filthy rags, and so when you when you think about this and get a word, a mental picture of someone coming to uh, a battle or a wedding feast and, and with their own armor, their own uh, filthy rags righteousness coming on, or you change the picture to what it would look like if God put the armor on us, if it's if it's made from the light of Christ, the armor of light. That's the way I see it. Um, and the top part, just briefly, just running out of time, uh, the night is far spent. It is beautiful. I agree with Brother Luke. I did a lot of um, uh, Shakespeare in college, and I learned on the King James, so it was easier when we did Shakespeare in school for me to understand it. Um, both are, are beautiful in their own ways. Uh, and this, this, this part, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off all works of darkness. Cast off that fil that filthy stuff, that stuff that we're born into. Uh, all, all the sin and all the darkness, all the evil thoughts, all the malice, all the stuff that that is gross and disgusting and put on what God provides us. He clothed Adam and Eve in the garden because they sinned. And they try to clothe themselves. I mean, we've been doing it since the beginning, putting our own stuff into it. And uh, and God God uh, made garments for him, and in the same way, in the end, to me, that's a shadow of what's going to happen. In the end, we're clothed with His righteousness. Amen. Uh, let me read the last uh, two verses, and we should be able to finish up uh, here on time, so you guys can uh, go to bed. It's almost bedtime for you on the East Coast. Uh, Renee, I'm going to ask you to respond to verse 12, 13, and 14 as I read it now in the KJV. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 
Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts. Right? I am so glad you put them all together because I didn't want to answer one without the other. I, I love what Jason said. He's absolutely right. The wedding garment must be the righteousness of God. <clears throat> and this one, the night is far spent. It's coming to an end. The, the darkness is coming to an end. And the armor of light, armor is impenetrable. It is something we wear so that weapons cannot penetrate us. So when we wear, as Jason was talking about, the righteousness of God in Christ, nothing can come against it. You know, when Satan attacks you, it's not my own righteousness. Of course, you're going to accuse me and point out my failings. But I'm not righteous because of what I do, but because of what Christ did. Now, who can condemn me? Mm. Because it's Christ's righteousness. It is God who justifies it. Yes. Himself. So uh, he's, he's reminding them of their identity. And the strength of the righteousness of God. And he says, because God has proclaimed you innocent and righteous, now let us walk honestly as in the day. Because the, the darkness is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envy. Now that's right. But the works are a fruit of knowing who we are in Christ. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Jason said, you're wearing the righteousness of Christ. Put him on and make not provision for the flesh. The flesh isn't born of God. It does not inherit the kingdom to fulfill the lust thereof. So mm -hmm. you're going to put on the righteousness of God. Know your identity, who God says he created you as. Mm -hmm. And then you can do these things. You can walk honestly as in the day. And not in strife and envy, because you're not fulfilling lust of the flesh. You're reckoning him dead. You are baptized into his death as well as into life. And so, when he died, the flesh died. We're to we're to reckon that guy dead, at, and we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We wear him as armor. Nobody can accuse Jesus of sin. You know, I, this is one of the things I see in these exorcisms by Catholic priests. They're, they're always as scared they've got to be holy enough. And they go through these uh, things where they got to feel worthy. Well, if you're in Christ, it's his righteousness that's making you feel worthy. Not yeah. anything you're doing. And I think it's so important to have that standing, that armor of God. And we're also told to wear the helmet of salvation mm. and then you won't have, have these arrows these fiery darts penetrating your mind telling you that you're not good enough that you fail that god's mad at you that you're condemned because you're seeing everything i call the grace goggles you're reading his word through grace goggles yeah everything through the goggles of grace mm. and that it's all christ so uh, I'm glad you put these three together because we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. not try to mimic him or act like him through will of our own efforts, but put him on. You know, and I, I think that's where uh, you'll see a lot of people trying to live outwardly righteous, but don't have any of the compassion, none of the grace, none of the joy, not, none of it towards people. Nothing but judgment and condemnation and finger pointing because they're not putting on Christ. They're putting on law of what they think Jesus would want them to do instead of allowing him to work in them. Amen. All right. Uh, let's uh, take a minute now to sum up our thoughts on the study. And uh, I want to respond to somebody in the chat room and uh, make my final remarks too. But uh, Brother Cribs, what do you think of the study tonight? Oh, I, I love it. And as usual, I'm, I'm edified by it. And there's uh, more for me to process and uh, pray about and think on uh, more later. 
Um, but I, I, I love these broadcasts and I like the, everyone on the panel that, um, we're all in agreement on, uh, on the gospel and, uh, we don't argue a whole lot either on this particular broadcast, and that's good. I mean, we're all, we all uh, seem to be able to uh, present the, the, the study of the scripture and, and back each other up, and that's, that's encouraging and edifying to me, too, personally. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And um, these verses tonight about uh, uh, being respectful to the authorities, I mean, they're, they're, it, he, they're not incredibly deep. It's, you know, it's not hard to grasp. Um, but the way he ends it here with this, with this last, the last few verses are just beautiful, as you said, Brother Luke. And um, I, I just want to double down on what Renee said, putting on Christ, this is verse 14, putting on Christ. Um, that's what I walk away with. That's what means the most to me. It's, it, it, you can take out of this whole, uh, this whole chapter and all, I mean, thus far, and also, um, Every verse in scripture is pointing to the same message. Put on Christ, put on Christ, put on Christ. You know, when people say, uh, you know, lordship, or they say works, put on Christ. That's the message. Thank you. All right. Thank you, brother. Sister Renee, sum up the study for us. Yeah, it, you know, it's uh, it started out uh, telling us how we, should respond to the world around us, those that are above us, those that are beside us. And it all boils down to one word, love. Everything's about love. It's about Christ's love for us and about our letting his love proceed out from us uh, to our leaders and to our neighbors and to God himself. Because honoring those in positions of authority that God has placed there is honoring God himself. So um, I think the, the word that sums up this chapter is just love. Amen. Uh, okay. I'd like to talk for a minute about our Sunday program. Um, and we've been doing it for almost a year and a half. And it, it began just a group discussion and, and it evolved eventually into actually a church. And we chose a name, Church Without Walls. Everybody loved it. And then we realized that Church Without Walls was used by other people and we didn't want to be confused. So we came up with another name, the uh, Church of the Eternally Secure. And when we embraced the idea of establishing an online church, a congregation of believers, uh, to study and learn and have fellowship together. We also sought out to uh, fill the needs of the congregation. Some people said, we need some time for prayer. So we allocate time to pray for each other in the Sunday program. Uh, we need, we'd like to have communion. So we adopted the first Sunday of every month, we have communion together. What about some praise and worship music? Brother Daniel has fill that that need he he sings some wonderful three songs for us every sunday and we enjoy that and worship with this great gospel music um and even someone says look grow your beard back and i said okay what the congregation wants if at all possible we're going to try to give you what you want but we do not only ask but we insist uh, on on our, our three things four things actually that we we are dogmatic in this respect dogma means this is something that there is no room for compromise there's no room for other opinions you must agree on these points it's an absolute necessity and these essentials or these three dogmas uh, are Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Jesus is not merely a prophet. He's not some great moral teacher or religious leader. He is God himself who became a man and our savior. Uh, the second dogma is that salvation is not based upon uh, our, us being good enough because we, don't, we all fail. We can never be good enough. Salvation is based upon 
the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. He paid for all of our sins and that salvation is a free gift we receive because we believe Jesus is our Savior and he has the power and faithfulness to give us eternal life. And then the third dogma is that when we believe in Jesus and receive this gift of eternal life, it truly is eternal. It's not probationary, subject to losing it uh, for any reason, that we, we cannot lose our salvation for any reason. No matter how much we sin, we can't lose it. No matter how much our, our faith wanes, we cannot lose it. No matter what... Uh, what happens? We can't even give it back if we say, I don't want it anymore, and we I hate God, I don't believe in God. Even then, you're stuck with it. That's how much we believe in eternal security. And now I see someone in the in the congregation, a Christian Centron, in the congregation now on a Wednesday night Bible study of this Church of the Eternally Secure. And he has the, the nerve to come into the congregation and proclaim that this doctrine of eternal security is wrong. He wrote, I tell you, brothers and sisters, in these last days that you are not once saved, always saved. And he trusted in himself, Luke. Yes, I saw your response to him. You're exactly right. He does not believe the gospel. If a person does not believe in it, they have eternal security. They don't believe the gospel. The gospel is... The fact that it's eternal life is a gift that's been given to us, and it's guaranteed that we cannot lose it. If you cannot understand that, you don't know the gospel, and you're not a Christian. Right. So my, my message to Cent uh, Centron, I won't call you Christian Centron, because based on your statement there, uh, you're not a, a, a Christian if you don't understand that it's about Christ and not about you or me. Yeah. Uh, uh, that uh, you're welcome to be in the con in the congregation. You can observe, you can listen. I hope you'll learn the truth and, and believe the truth. But you're not welcome to be in the chat room putting forth uh, the damnable heresy of a false gospel. Yeah. So uh, that's the warning to, to you, and uh, we will not allow you in there if you continue to do it. it. When you say you can lose salvation, what you're saying is it, your salvation is not based on the already done work of Jesus. You're basing your salvation on what you do. And that is works for salvation. The salvation message, God's report of his son, is that he gives us eternal life. And that life is in his son. The life is eternal. And we have it because Christ did the work for it. That's what believing the gospel means, that he died for our sins. If my entire debt owed because of my sin is paid by Christ, how can I be condemned? He already died for it. The wages of sin is death, but Christ paid that death penalty. If you don't believe that, you do not believe the gospel, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that will be the end of the study for tonight. And uh, I, I just want to thank everybody in the congregation. Thank you for being with us and participating again. And uh, to uh, also to Renee, Cripps, and Michael, uh, wonderful that you're with us every Wednesday. And, and uh, don't forget to join us next Sunday. Also, if you want to come to Las Vegas, uh, put your name on the list saying, I I'm absolutely want to come to Las Vegas and join everybody. Get under one roof sometime this next year. Uh, we'll figure out a date once we know how many people want to come so we can have a uh, at least one time where we're all together uh, instead of just you know, online. Um, and also tell them to send me a, a notification if you have miracles that you'd like to share on a, on a future program. Uh, and if you have any clever one-liners like Brother Michael, he, he said, re religion is a set of rules. Is that what it goes? Religion is a set of rules. And Jesus is, oh, I forgot, I forgot how it goes. You remember, Renee, Cripps? 
I don't remember exactly. Religion, religion sets the rules oh, yeah. or something like that. And Jesus sets us free or something. Yeah, I think you got right. Religion sets the rules. That's what Clint Centron is trying to do, set the rules. Yeah. But Jesus says free from the rules. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you all and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.